thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here today to talk to all of you about uh, commercial leasing, which is a focus of my particular practice. So what I thought I would do today is go through the five ideas that was in the handout that was sent out to you, which were my five good ideas. Just sort of talk about um, some of the things that I thought about when I put those five ideas together. And then after that, we'll have a session where you guys can talk about the ideas as well as any ideas that you have. But if you do have any questions as I go through, please feel free to, to stop me and ask me questions. Always happy to explain issues or to answer anything, anything that uh, comes to mind when we're talking about the ideas that I had. So the first idea that I had was um, a commercial lease governs a long-term relationship, so be good to one another. So lease agreements are usually for a lengthy period of time when you consider the term as well as any extension or renewal rights. And so what you want to think about is when you're starting to negotiate um, your offer to lease, that really is going to set the tone for future interactions between the parties. And those interactions are going to include day-to-day -day lease issues, you know, like paying your rent or dealing with any repair or maintenance obligations. And so you're going to have to have constant communication between the parties. And so you just want to think about how it is that you're going to want to deal with each other and start it off that way when you're at the offer stage. And so the other thing that I was thinking about is, you know, talking about what are the basic terms in a lease that you want to look for and what is it that makes a lease enforceable. And so when you're, when you're thinking about that, you want to think about the parties to the lease and you want to make sure you have the proper legal name of the entities. And then you want to think about your space. And so with the space, you want to make sure that you've described it properly. And one of the ways that we often do this in a lease is to have a sketch of the particular space. So you want to see where the space is located on the floor itself as well as the layout of the, of the floor plan for your particular space. Uh, the next thing you want to think about is the commencement date. So when is your lease going to start? Is it going to start when you sign the lease? Or are there other things that have to happen first before you want your lease to commence? So a good example of this is if you're going into a space and as a tenant you're going to be doing a number of improvements to the space, maybe you don't want the lease to start until after those improvements are done. And the reason why you might not want that is, you know, because you're not paying rent during that period of time. And also for your renewals or extensions, you want to make sure that those are pushed out um, to coincide with when you're actually going to be going in and using the space. Um, one of the other things you want to think about that will make, uh, that are the basic terms of the lease is the duration of the term. So how long is your lease going to be for? Are there going to be renewal periods? And how long are each of those periods going to be? You want to make sure that that's set out um, in, your, uh, in your lease agreement. Uh, also, you want to think about the rental terms. So your base rent, what is that going to be payable on a monthly basis? And then what's your additional rent? And then on top of your additional rent, you want to think about things like utilities. Are those included in your additional rent? Are those on top? Because the landlord may include specific provisions in the lease that set out utilities, realty tax payments, those types of things. Um, and then the last thing that you want to think about, it's sort of more um, a broad uh, category that I talk about which are the material terms of the contract. Now these are things that are going to be like your deal breakers or those things that are really important to you. You want to make sure that those are set out in your offer document or as well as so that it makes it into your lease agreement. Um, and it's best I think to do it at the offer stage because you want to get those issues on the table and talk about those between the landlord and the tenant. You don't want any surprises when you come to the lease stage and you know something is important to you and that didn't get communicated or it just didn't make it into the offer. So one of the things that I always think about is if we sort of go back to the uh, example that I was using for improvements is if there are improvements that are being done and those are important to you, what is the landlord doing? What is the tenant doing? Set those things specifically out in terms of what each party is going to do as well as if there's a tenant allowance, you want to make sure that you get that in there and that you have that discussion with the landlord. Is the landlord going to pay for things that the tenant is doing as a way to you know, induce you to come into the space? So those types of things are the material terms that you want to think about in terms of getting those in at the offer stage and discussing those um, more at the beginning of the relationship. Uh, the next idea that um, I talked about was funding may impact a nonprofit tenant's ability to meet its obligations under the lease. What protections can a tenant negotiate that a landlord might be willing to include in a commercial lease? So your ability to be able to negotiate special terms into a lease is always going to be dependent upon the leverage between the parties. There are some larger landlords that just will not make changes to their standard form lease and you know, we all have to, to deal with that particular issue. But there is some things that you can think about as a nonprofit or even you know, uh, from a tenant's perspective that um, 
you know, may help you later on in terms of dealing with situations where the corporation is sort of moving through its life cycle as well as dealing with different issues. And the types of clauses that I was thinking about was, um, you know, an early termination right. Um, this can help address situations where funding for a particular project or initiative is no longer available. Um, and a landlord may be open to discussing those types of clauses and may be willing to include those in the lease in situations where you're talking about an early expiry right that may, say, for example, be in the last couple years of your lease term. And maybe you're not taking a whole floor and that adjoining tenant also has an expiry period coming up. Maybe an opportunity for the landlord as well to be able to then lease you know, the, the space, a larger space to a, a tenant that requires um, that kind of space in a building. Uh, the other thing is that the landlord may be willing to do um, an extension right, or sorry, an ex a termination right, sorry, um, where they, um, if, if it's reciprocal. So the landlord may say, okay, well, you can terminate it, but I want to be able to terminate it, say, again, during the last couple years of the lease. Uh, the other thing is that a landlord may be agreeable where you provide a security deposit, and then the if you exercise that right, then the, the landlord would keep that deposit. Um, the other way to do it is that a landlord may say, okay, well, I'll give you this right, but you have to give me a year's notice so that they can then find somebody else to go into this space. So there are ways to sort of deal with that um, imbalance and leverage between the parties um, and explaining the issue to the landlord um, so that they can you know, understand where you're coming from is, is, is a good way to start so that you, you may be able to get that type of, of right into your lease document. Uh, the other way you want to think about it too is in terms of expansion rights. Again, you know, if you're thinking about taking on a particular project or if you know that's coming down the road, you may want to say, okay, well, we'd like a right to um, be able to take some adjoining space. Again, if you're not in the whole floor or if you are on the whole floor, some space above or below the floors. Um, most landlords will be agreeable to this because, again, it's going to secure their income stream. So they'll be okay with having that type of right in there. And usually you see it as either an option or a right of, re first, right of first refusal. Uh, when it's an option, um, as the space becomes available, um, you will have a right as a tenant to that particular space. When you've got a right of first refusal, it's where the landlord has received an offer for that particular space from a third party. And so what the landlord would do would, there would be a provision built into the lease where the landlord would come to the tenant and say, okay, I've got this third party offer. If you want the space, I'll give it to you, but you have to take it on the same terms and conditions. So that's the difference between the, the offer and the option. And I should just say with the option, um, the option that you would have, you would have that space on the same terms and conditions as your current or existing lease. Um, the other thing that you may want to think about in terms of you know, ways to sort of deal with those, um, those funding issues is with respect to your use clause. Um, from a tenant's perspective, we always want this use clause to be as broad as possible and then the landlord wants it to be as narrow as possible. The reason why it can help you out a little bit is that, you know, corporations and, and nonprofits are always sort of changing what they're doing. They may be taking on new departments or their business may expand into new markets. And so you may have a need for more people and more space. Um, and so because of the, uh, the change in the way that you're going to use your space, um, if, if you have that broad use clause, you're going to be able to incorporate those things. Sometimes landlords will try to uh, include exclusions to the use. And the reason why they do that is they'll say, well, we don't want certain types of businesses in our office. For example, they often don't want call centers in certain types of office centers or certain types of customer service um, centers in the buildings. So they'll try to narrow the use because they don't want certain clientele or they don't want people there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, those types of things. So those are the discussions that you'll you know, have to have with the landlord um, when you're talking about getting a, a broader lease clause so that when you expand your business or if you take on a new initiative, you'll be able to do that and not be in breach of your lease. Um, the other thing you want to think about too is that if, even if you are unable to get these clauses into your lease agreement, you have to remember the lease is a contract. So if the parties decide for whatever reason that they want to change the terms or they want to terminate the lease, you can always do that. And what I always say is you don't know unless you ask. And you never know what position the landlord or the other parties are going to be at three years down the road. And so there may be an opportunity if, you know, for example, uh, your business has changed and you no longer need this particular space. Um, you don't want to have to be paying rent on this space for, say, there's two years left in your lease. 
we re I recently did this with an entity and, and um, they didn't have a termination right in their lease and they didn't know what to do. And so they went and they talked to the landlord and the landlord wasn't, nece wasn't agreeable to terminating the lease right then and there, but they said, okay, well, you know, let's do it in a six month period. That should give me enough time to find a, a, a party to go into the space. And so they were able to save some money that way and they were able to come to an agreement even though they didn't have this termination rate negotiated at the beginning of, of their relationship. So it's always just something to think about um, in terms of you know, when we're talking about the leverage between parties and what you can and cannot get at the beginning, you may be able to get um, later on um, in, in the relationship. Uh, the third point that I wanted to talk about is insurance. So insurance provisions in a commercial lease should be reviewed by an insurance provider. Uh, most people that are negotiating the lease, lawyers included, are not insurance experts. And these clauses are, they can be very complicated. And so I think the best course of action and, and what we would normally do with these types of provisions is send the provision to the insurance provider for the tenant as well as send the provision to the insurance pro provider for the landlord. Get these two parties talking to each other. They speak the same language and they can negotiate those types of clauses much more efficiently than we can. And they'll be able to determine whether or not the tenant's current policy meets the requirements of, of the landlord. Um, that being said, there are a couple things that I think that you should be aware of and think about when you're looking at these types of clauses. Uh, the first thing is, is that often you see in a lease, it will say that the tenant is to provide um, a copy of the insurance policy. These are very cumbersome documents and you know, a landlord probably is not going to renew it. So the way that you, or sorry, review that. So the way that you can deal with that is to um, have the lease amended so that it says that the tenant is to provide a certificate of insurance. And that has all the information that the landlord needs. Most landlords are agreeable to that kind of change in, in their standard form lease. Um, and that makes everybody's life a little bit easier. Um, those certificates typically can be generated quite quickly by their, the insurance provider. And the other thing you want to think about is how often do you want to have to provide that from a tenant's perspective. Generally, if you do it annually or even just when the lease is signed, the landlord will be happy with that. Um, the other thing that you want to think about is typically in a lease you'll see that the um, insurance will say, the insurance provisions will say that the tenant has to have the landlord as a named insured on their policy. Most tenant policies are not going to allow you to do this, um, but what they will allow you to do is to list, um, you get a special endorsement that's attached to the policy um, to deal with landlords as additional insured, so not named insured, additional insured. Um, most landlords are fine with this change um, because like I said, most policies, they're not going to let the tenant list the landlord as named insured or if they do, there's going to be an additional cost to do that and nobody wants to have to incur additional costs when there's another way um, to approach that type of, of issue. Um, so like I said, most landlords are going to be okay with that, that type of a change. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to talk about with respect to insurance is waiver of subrogation. I often get asked this question, what does it mean? Because you often see it in um, lease provisions dealing with insurance. And so what it means is that um, when there's a loss by a tenant um, resulting from some action of the landlord, um, the tenant will make a claim to their insurer under their insurance policy. The insurer then pays the tenant out for that loss. And then the insurer wants to be able to go after the landlord because the loss that was caused was as the result of something that the landlord did. So the insurer basically steps into the shoes of the tenant and, and can go after the landlord. So what the landlord says is, no, I want you to waive that. Um, you, we want the insurer to waive that because the tenant has paid these premiums and you as the insurer should just look to those premiums that have been paid by the tenant as the recovery for you for that money being paid out to the tenant. So that's what that particular issue is. And like I said, I get asked that question a lot of times. So it's, that's sort of the simplified version of understanding what a waiver of, of subrogation is. And I think it's important to understand because that can get into a lot of discussions um, in lease negotiations. Uh, the next, uh, I, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. So typically, so typically what you wanna do is talk to your insurance provider. Most providers are okay with having the waiver of subrogation. Um, I haven't come across an insurer where they said they wouldn't do it. Um, and so it's a request by the landlord to have this waiver of subrogation. And like I said, most insurance providers will be okay with it. 
Um, and, and so it's just making sure, like, like I said, you'll see that language in there and, and some people will try and cross it out. But talk to your provider um, because at the end of the day, they're, they're probably okay with that language being in the lease. So it's just understanding the concept and confirming with your insurance provider. I'm sorry? The waiver of subrogation? So the waiver of subrogation is that um, the subrogation is where the insurer can go after the landlord in place of the tenant. Because the landlord and the tenant, they are the, the parties that have the contract, right? So they have the right to sue each other if there's anything that happens between the parties that is in breach of the lease. There are certain situations where there's a loss by the tenant and vice versa, where the acts of the other party have caused this loss, but because you've got insurance provision, provisions in your lease agreement, there are certain situations where the parties have agreed that you know, we're gonna go to our insurance provider to cover that loss as opposed to suing each other. So that's why you have that waiver of subrogation because then the insurance provider is also brought into that relationship where they will not sue the landlord for recovery because of a loss they had to pay out. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah so if you want the right to be reciprocal, which some parties do, so you can include that. And again, the landlord's insurance provider is usually agreeable to that. But the thing you need to keep in mind though is that from a tenant's perspective, you have to be careful, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, in terms of your operating costs that are going to be set out in the lease. Because what you'll see often in operating costs is that if the landlord um, um, had to um, sort of deal with any issues through their insurance provider and it was a cost to them, they may sort of back end that into your operating costs. So you just need to keep that in mind that you absolutely can get it as a reciprocal um, agreement between the parties for the, for, between the landlord and the tenant. And most, I think, insurance providers are agreeable to that and will be okay with that provision in there. And most landlords and tenants will, will do it. If the, if the landlord's getting it, the tenant wants it, that's, that's fair. Um, but like I said, you just sort of, you need to be careful in terms of what is in your operating costs and if that cost is going to sort of end up coming back to you as a tenant anyways, because maybe then it's not worth the fight. Is that good? Okay. Uh, so the next point that I had was, well, we can't predict the future. We should always consider the possibilities. Corporations, including nonprofit organizations, are dynamic, and a well thought out assignment clause can assist with the ebbs and flows in a corporation's life cycle. So there's always reasons why a tenant may want to assign or sublet its space. Um, and it's also another way that you can, you can deal with um, ups and downs with your funding um, to be able to grow as well as to contract in your space. And one thing that I find that um, a number of corporations and a number of, of leases that I dealt with for nonprofits is um, you want to pay close attention to this clause because it's a way that you can use your resources um, more efficiently. So for, for example, um, I dealt with a client and uh, they and another corporation wanted to use the space because they wanted to share receptionists, they wanted to share photocopier, they wanted to share boardroom services. And the way that we were able to do that was because we had this uh, assignment clause that allowed the, the entities to share that space. So when you're negotiating your, your lease agreement and your offer, you want to think about those types of possibilities that you may want to plan for. And typically in a lease, um, the assignment and sublease provision will say that you have to get landlord consent to be able to do these things. Um, but there are certain exceptions that a landlord would be agreeable to including in the, in the consent requirement. Um, so for example, you often see in leases, there's an exception where the tenant wants to assign to an affiliate, subsidiary, a parent, holding body corporate, those types of entities, as well as where they're doing a merger or an amalgamation um, with another company. And so what the landlord will say is, okay, you don't have to come to us for consent, but you do have to give us notice that this is happening. We want to know who's in our space. And so that type of carve out from the consent requirement is something that you usually can negotiate um, with, with the landlord. Um, the other thing that you want to think about too is that if you are, um, if, if you're aware that there might be some type of exception that you want to negotiate, again, you want to do it sooner rather than later. So think about it at the offer stage. Uh, the other thing is that you always need to think about the timing and the process to do an assignment or a sublease. Um, there's documentation that has to be put in place. 
and the landlord's consent is usually not effective until that particular documentation is done. So that means the parties have to negotiate a sublease. There's normally a document between um, the, the landlord and the new entity that they agree to be, um, uh, they agree to abide by certain obligations within the lease as well as within the, the sublease and everybody wants to make sure that um, all the parties sign on to that. And that takes time to negotiate. Um, as well as the, I guess the last thing that I would say about this is that um, if you have sort of a bigger transaction that's going on, say for example you are doing sort of um, a reorganization or a merger um, and, and it's not included as an exception or there's some, some, for, some sort of reorganization that you're doing with another entity. Um, to, to work through the process, it, it does take time. You need to think about that. And the other thing that you want to think about is too is that oftentimes in these types of provisions, you'll see that the landlord has a right to terminate the lease where a request is made by the tenant. And you want to try and carve that back. And so how to do that is to say, okay, well, yes, you landlord, you can terminate if we make this request. But if you tell me as the tenant that you're going to do that, then I want to be able to take my request back from you. So that means that the lease stays in place and you just cannot assign um, to that other entity and you, because you, as a tenant you don't want to lose, this, lose your lease. Um, so you, you, that, that provision is you want to make sure you watch out for because you, you don't want to get yourself into a situation where you make that request and then now all of a sudden you don't have the space and you don't have the lease anymore. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to talk about was uh, even though the lease provides that it is a net lease, Landlords and tenants often agree to certain deductions and exclusions from operating costs payable by the tenant. So a landlord will want everything that you are paying as a tenant to the landlord to be included as rent or additional rent. And the reason that they want that is because there are certain rights that a landlord has to enforce when a tenant doesn't pay its rent. Um, the, I think the best example is that you know, they can go in and, and sort of see some of the assets. So, you'll often see some language in the lease that, that talks about all the monies payable under the lease are additional rent. Um, and the operating costs, which are the additional rent, are typically those costs and expenses that are incurred by a landlord um, in connection with the operation, repair, maintenance, um, and management of the property. And so what you'll see in the lease is there's usually a definition of operating costs and it includes a list of, of all of those things um, that they're including. Now, it's generally been that it's a non-exhaustive list, so then the landlord can include anything you know, that, that happens in the future that they didn't think about at the time when they were negotiating the lease. But what we're seeing is that these lists are actually getting longer and longer. And the reason is that there is some case law that supports um, the proposition that if the landlord doesn't set out those specific items that are included as operating costs, they cannot recover those. So you're starting to see these provisions become much more specific in terms of what the landlord is including. The other thing that will be in that provision is the landlord will typically include a list of those items that can be deducted or excluded. And sometimes you'll get a landlord that will include nothing because they'll want you to tell them what you think should be deducted from the operating costs. And so the things that you want to look for um, in that particular list of exclusions or deductions are things like cost for structural repairs to the building, uh, penalties incurred by the landlord for not paying taxes on time, uh, fees for enforcing lease provisions with other tenants, um, repairs that would be done pursuant to some sort of warranty, uh, bad debt losses, um, and any costs that would be incurred by the landlord where they've recovered proceeds through their insurer. Um, and typically how operating costs work is that these costs are estimated by the landlord at the beginning of the year and they're charged on, the monthly, on a monthly basis. And then at the end of the year, the landlord will figure out what they actually spent and then they'll figure out um, what um, proportion is, is each tenant's responsibility. So when you're looking at that type of provision, you want to think about including some language that allows the tenant to review this calculation. Because you want to make sure that the way the landlord has done things and, and the things that are included are, are what you understand as those operating costs that you as a tenant are responsible for. Um, the other thing that you want to think about with these provisions is if there's an excess or a shortfall, how are those being dealt with? And so some of the things that you can think about including, and again, landlords typically agreeable to these types of changes to, this, to the standard form lease. Um, you can think about including a clause where you say the landlord has to provide the tenant 
with a statement that sets out those those um, actual costs within a certain period of time at the end of the, from the end of the calendar year, and that the tenant has a period of time to review those those calculations, and if they don't object within again another period of time, um, say like a 30-day time period, then the tenant is deemed to accept those costs and everybody's okay. The way that you can deal with any excess or shortfall, I always find that you know, from a tenant's perspective, obviously the excess is the one that you're most concerned about. So what you want to do is include some language to say that if there is an excess, that the landlord will apply that to, um, to the rent, or if you're at the end of your lease, that the landlord will provide the tenant with um, those funds within 30 days of the lease expiring. 